Stick with the program. I can imagine these words being said by a coach of a team exhorting his players to stay with the direction of his coaching. Maybe a personal coach urging his or her client to not deviate from the diet and exercise routine that was established to achieve a healthier body. Or it might be the advice given to one fighting an addiction to continue to apply the steps of the program they're on to keep themselves away from that addictive object. I can also hear the Apostle Paul telling these young Christians in Colossae to do the same thing. Stick with the program. Stay with the truth you already know. And that's especially true in this letter because these young believers were being enticed to follow a new direction, to abandon the truth they had been taught and to go in another way. He wants them to to continue in Christ, to grow up strong. And he says, don't deviate from what you've been taught, what you've already heard and learned. Warren Wiersbe observes, in the Christian life, we can never stand still. Either we go forward or gradually slip backward. Let us go on to maturity, we're told in Hebrews 6.1. The Christian who is not making spiritual progress is an open target for the enemy to attack and destroy. And what we find here in in two short verses in Colossians chapter 2, Paul provides a program for progress in the Christian life. It's simple, but in describing this as simple, I'm not suggesting that it's easy, uh, but it is right. And if we stick with the program we will see spiritual progress. So take a look at these two verses with me. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Chuck Swindoll writes, the essence of the Christian life is packed in these two verses. We would do well to meditate on them or even memorize them. I'll be honest with you, when I started preparing tonight's message, I had a much longer text. In fact, I was going to begin here and go to the end of chapter 2. And I realized these two verses have so much in them, (laughs) they, they deserve a study of their own. And I'm not even sure we will mine all that is said in just one message, although I intend to. But there is a lot here in just a few words. Other commentators write that these two verses summarize well the basic teaching of Colossians. He makes this statement and then the rest of the letter explains it. (laughs) Why and how we do these things. Another writes, this paragraph is the heart of Colossians. In these two verses, Paul succinctly summarizes the basic response that he wants from his readers. If you want to know what the Christian life is all about, you really find it right here. You find everything that we need. Now, a phrase that echoes throughout this passage and in the verses that follow is, in Christ or in Him, and of course, Him referring to Christ. It's one of Paul's favorite expressions. You find it over 200 times in his letters. It's in every one of his letters except the letter to Titus. All believers, regardless of their standing, regardless of their ethnic, their educational background, their experiences, all Christians are in Christ. These words are applied to individuals. They're also applied to churches. For Paul, all of life is lived in Christ. No part of life is too great or too small to be outside of that realm. And the key to the Christian life from start to finish is to be in Christ. But we don't hear about this enough. We don't focus on what does it mean to be in Christ. To be in Christ is to occupy the richest position that can be ours this side of heaven. It's talking about our lives right now, not just eternal life, 
We often hear about the abundant life. And when Jesus talked about that you might have life and have it more abundantly, it was in John chapter 15 when he's talking about being in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. That's the key to our Christian life, being in Christ. And these verses give us a program for progress, the Christian life here on earth. The first element of the program is to be grounded in the gospel. Verse 6 serves as kind of a hinge in this letter between the first major section uh, from the beginning up to verse 5 of chapter 2 and then the next section which goes from here down through chapter 4 and verse 6. The first clause succinctly restates the key theological argument of the letter. Christ is Lord, and we have entered into his lordship. The second clause summarizes the specific commands and warnings that follow. We are to continue to live in him. I think some translations say continue to walk in him, and both of those are right. It's our walk of life. It's our daily Practice. Continue. You've received Christ as Lord. Now continue in that same direction. And this is crucial. You notice it says you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. The Greek word there is kurios. It speaks of authority, of lordship, and especially tied to ownership. When we receive Christ, it's not so much we have him as he has us. We belong to him. We submit to him as Lord. Now, about 30 years ago, 30, 35 years ago, there grew out a, a controversy among Christians over what was called lordship salvation. Can a person receive Jesus as Savior, but not Lord? And there were a number of very high-ranking, respected Christian scholars who said, yes, a person can receive Christ as Savior, have their sins forgiven, but not have Christ as Lord. And then there were folks on the other side that said, absolutely not. How can you separate the two? I think A.W. Tozer said it the best. Either Jesus Christ is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And we cannot pick and choose those areas of our lives that come under the Lordship of Christ. He not only wants to be our Savior, but he must be our Lord. And if he is our Lord, that means he owns us. And he has the right to tell us what to do and what not to do, where to go. We are to submit to him. So I think it's very important that Paul says, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord. True conversion implies the right of Christ to rule. We let him in and say, here I am. The spirit comes in, we allow him control. We've talked a few weeks ago in our morning message about being filled with the spirit. And how that means to live under his influence or under his control. That's the idea here. If Jesus Christ is Lord, we are to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. And allow him to guide us and direct us. It's a life in which we walk in him. Every step is directed by the Lord who has that right to tell us what to do, where to go. And so the Christian comes into any and every situation willingly recognizing Christ's authority in that part of his life. There is no part of our lives where Christ's lordship does not come into play. Now Paul says we are to be rooted in this truth. Rooted is an agricultural word. The tense of the Greek word means once for all having been rooted. So Paul is looking back here at their conversion, at their salvation. When you received Christ Jesus as Lord, you were rooted. You were rooted in what? You were rooted in the truth. We are rooted 
in God's truth. And Christians are not to be tumbleweeds that have no roots, blown around by every wind of doctrine. We're not even to be transplants that are repeatedly moved from one soil to another. Once we are rooted by faith in Christ, there's no need to change the soil. (laughs) Everything we need, we find right here in God's Word. We find through the Spirit of God living in us, that should be our roots, and we need to be rooted. Roots give strength and stability. I imagine Paul was probably thinking of Psalm 1 when he wrote this. I love Psalm 1. It's short, it's succinct, but but it is so true. And in that first verse, it says, you know, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the way of sinners, who does not stand in the counsel of the ungodly or sit in the seat of mockers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. Verse 3 says, He will be like a tree planted by rivers of water, whose leaf does not wither and who brings forth fruit in his season. Whatever he does prospers. That's the Christian life, is to be rooted and rooted in a place where we are nourished and fed by the living water and the the bread of life so that we can grow. Remember the parable Jesus told about the soil, right? And the the farmer sowing seed. And and some of the seed fell on the, the hard path. Birds came and ate it up. Do you know that the other three types of soil, the seeds actually sprouted. But what happened? Two of those three had no roots. The one on rocky soil withered. The one with the weeds was choked out. It did not have the proper root system in order to flourish. Only one of the four established the roots and was able to bear fruit. So it's important that we stay grounded in the gospel, rooted in Christ. Strong roots stabilize growth. And what's true of trees is certainly true of Christians. (laughs) Roots strengthen us and support us against the prevailing winds of persuasion. When others come to us with very fine-sounding arguments, and, and boy, it seems to make sense to us, It's our network of solid roots that holds us firm and keeps us straight. Beautiful branches and and delicate leaves, no matter how attractive, fail to fortify us when we're into the wind and the storms of life. It takes roots, thick, deep, powerful roots to keep us standing strong. Paul says you need to be grounded in the gospel. He says something very similar in Ephesians Uh, 3.17, we should be rooted and grounded in love. And that ought to uh, dictate our relationships with others. So here we have this idea of being rooted in the faith. Now that takes time. There's no instant route to a large root system. And it's hard work. And it's not always pretty. You ever notice when a, a, a painter paints a scene and there's trees and, and you see this beautiful tree and it's, it's full of leaves and, and it looks so vibrant? They don't spend a lot of time painting the roots, do they? In fact, probably not at all. So much of it is seen underground and, and if you dig it up, it's, it, it's not real impressive to look at, but it's absolutely vital. If there is not the roots below, you will not have the leaves and the fruit above. So being rooted in the gospel is very, very important. The second step we see is growing in grace. Receiving Christ is not the end, but the beginning of the Christian life. The foundation of faith is there, but it must be built upon. What we first learned opens us up to increasing knowledge. In Peter's second letter, He concludes with these words, 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Well, he actually gives us the answer at the beginning of the letter. (laughs) Back in 2 Peter 1, beginning in verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us everything we need 
for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. Now, listen to this program for progress. Here's Peter's, uh, his, his idea here. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to your goodness knowledge and to your knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. That probably ought to sound a little bit familiar because a lot of those are the fruit of the Spirit. Allowing the Spirit of God to work in our lives, we're going to produce this fruit. But it's growing in grace. It's not stopping. And unfortunately, we tend to do that with too many believers. They come to Christ. They make their commitment of faith. They announce their allegiance to the Savior. And we say, that's great. You're in. And then we go off to the next. But that's only the beginning. It's a new birth. They're a baby. They need to grow up. And that's where the discipleship comes in. That's why it's so important, especially for a new believer. It's important for all of us, but it's especially important for a new believer to be in church, to be fed, to be taught, to have somebody come alongside and say, how are you doing in your Christian life? How can I help you? How can I encourage you? Because once we're grounded in the gospel, we need to grow in grace. Now, interesting in this passage here in Colossians, Paul says we are rooted in the gospel, and that's in what's called the aorist tense in the Greek. That means once and for all. You were once for all planted and rooted in the truth. But this idea of growing in grace, continue to live or to walk in him, it's in the present tense. It's an ongoing process. We were saved at one point in time, but then from that point forward, we continue to grow. And the sad thing is, there are an awful lot of Christians who have never grown beyond their conversion. And they may, they may be a Christian for 5, 10, 20 years, and they've never grown. They, they, they don't have any marks of maturity. They, they evidence no fruit of the Spirit in their lives. They're still swept away by every, every wind that comes along in life. They have no roots and they are not growing. Now, Peter says make every effort, but I don't want you to confuse this by living life in your own strength. We get the gift of grace for each day the same we get, way we get the gift of grace for our salvation, by receiving it freely from Christ. The Christian life is a grace adventure from the beginning to the end. We don't just need grace at the beginning and then we're off on our own. Max Lucado gives a, a humorous illustration of this point. Comes in his book, Come Thirsty. Turn north at Stress Village, drive a few miles east of Worryville, bear right at the fork leading to Worn Out Valley, and you'll find yourself entering the weary streets of Tuckered Town. Her residents live up to the name. They lumber like pack mules on Pike's Peak Climb. Eyes down, faces long, shoulders slumped, Ask them to explain their sluggish ways, and they point to their cars. You'd be tired, too, if you had to push one of these. To your amazement, that's what they do. Shoulders pressing, feet digging, lungs puffing. They muscle automobiles up and down the street. Rather than sit behind the wheel, they lean against the trunk. The sight puzzles you. The sound stuns you. Do you hear what you think you hear? Yes, the engines are running. Citizens of Tucker Town turn the key, start the car, slip it into neutral, and shove. You have to ask someone why. A young mother rolls her minivan into the grocery store parking lot. You ever thought of pressing the gas? You ask. I do, she replies, brushing sweat away. I press the gas to start the car, and then I take over. It's kind of a bizarre answer. But no more bizarre than that of the out-of-breath fellow leaning against his 18-wheeler, wheezing like an overweight marathoner. Did you push the truck, you ask? I did, he gasped, covering his mouth with an oxygen mask. Why not use the accelerator? 
he cocks an eyebrow, because I'm a tucker trucker, and we're strong enough to do our own work. He doesn't look strong to you, but you say nothing. Just walk away wondering, what kind of people are these? A pedal pushed away from power, yet they ignore it. Who would live in such a way? Paul asked the Galatian church an identical question. You began your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you're trying to make it complete on your own? That's foolish. Is God nothing more than a jumper cable? Start up strength and nothing more. Harsh words, joyless days, contentious relationships, thirsty hearts. You find more excitement at an Amish prom. Lucado wrote that, I didn't. <clears throat> who wants to live in Tuckered Town? Moreover, who wants to move there? Nothing repels non-Christians more than gloomy Christians. No one wants a free truck if you have to push it. Your neighbor doesn't, you don't, and God doesn't want it for any of us. He never intended for you to preambulate your own life. His word for tuckered out Christians, as you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, so continue to live in him. How does one receive Christ? By coming thirsty and drinking deeply. How does one live in Christ? By coming thirsty and drinking deeply. When you do, saving power becomes staying power. God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day Jesus Christ comes back again. Christ did not give you a car and tell you to push it. He didn't give you a car and tell you to drive it. You know what he did? He threw open the passenger door, invited you to take a seat, and told you to buckle up for the adventure of your life. That's what Christian living is about. It's not trying harder. It's allowing, if I can borrow from a country song, Jesus, take the wheel. You take control. You guide me. You direct me. You help me grow. And so Paul says, those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord must continue to live in him. Continue to walk in him. Earlier in this letter, he said, walk worthy of the Lord, in chapter 1 and verse 10. He later uses this image again in chapters 3 and 4. In the Ephesian epistle, which was probably written right around the same time, Paul uses this image of walking in the Lord no less than seven times. He viewed the Christian life as a walk. Now, a walk is very simple, but a walk means that you're going somewhere. You're not standing still. And if we're walking in the Spirit, we are growing in grace. We are growing up in the Lord. Now, this new learning must be consistent with the old. The Christian who grows in knowledge can claim further enlightenment only so far as it is loyal to the saving gospel truths which first led him to Christ. See, we don't come to Christ by faith and then start off on some other weird way. The same gospel that saves is the gospel that sanctifies. The same gospel that leads us to heaven is a map here on earth. It shows us how to live. You started with Christ, you must continue with Christ. You started with faith, you continue with faith. It's the only way to make spiritual progress. You see, the Christian life is a life of growing up in Christ, not just growing old on earth. The Christian life is about maturity, not longevity. We want to grow in grace. And then finally, Paul's program for progress includes gushing with gratitude. Look at verse 7. It ends overflowing with thankfulness. You know, thankfulness is a good test of our spiritual state. A thankless spirit betrays a life that's no longer functioning and focusing on the greatness of Christ. It's looking down, not up. Thankful hearts herald spiritual health. There's no greater example of that than the Israelites in the wilderness. Think about it. God was there every single day providing manna, providing meat when they asked for it, providing water in the middle of a desert, guiding them with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. And, and what was their reaction? Gripe, gripe, gripe. 
at no time were the Israelite people ever thankful. And unfortunately, we see a lot of that in our own culture. We have ceased to be a thankful people. We may be, probably are, the most blessed nation on the face of the earth. And yet, how thankful are we? Oh yeah, we have a day we call Thanksgiving once a year. But I think there's more family and food and football than there is truly giving thanks on that fourth Thursday of November. And we shouldn't just give thanks on one day. It should be a daily, it should be an hourly experience. We should constantly be grateful for all that God has given to us. Now, like so many things in the Christian life, Thanksgiving is not an emotion. Oh, it is possible to feel grateful, but to give thanks means you're doing something. It's an act. Thanksgiving is a verb. It's something we do. It's a choice. And we can choose to give thanks even when we don't feel like it. We can give thanks when it doesn't seem logical to give thanks. In fact, if you look at some verses in the Bible that speak of giving thanks, you'll see that it's not dependent upon our circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Ephesians 5.20, Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13.15, through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. We don't need to offer animals anymore because Jesus died. But we can offer a sacrifice of praise. And when is praise a sacrifice? When you don't feel like it. When the circumstances wouldn't necessarily call for thanksgiving and we give thanks anyway. That's a sacrifice of praise. And we're called to do that. And then from Colossians, but later on, Colossians 3, 15 and 16. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. If you were to describe your average worship service in one word, what do you think it would be? Anybody says boring, I'm going to talk to you after the service. <clears throat> Unfortunately, though, isn't that what a lot of people think of? Boring. How sad. If there is one word that should categorize and classify every part of our worship, it should be thanksgiving. We sing with thankful hearts. We give with thankful hearts. We come around the table grateful for Christ's sacrifice. We listen to God's word thankful for his direction. Every part of our worship should be done in gratitude and I would say the same is true in our lives. People should know us to be gushing with gratitude. I love that word picture, overflowing with thanksgiving. We shouldn't be like the four-year-old that when someone gives us something, mom has to say, what do you say? And we say, thank you, right? We should be overflowing with gratitude. Thanksgiving to God. To be bursting with thankfulness is a true witness of the Spirit inside us. This is a fine test on which we may judge the authentic quality of our spiritual growth. To be filled with gratitude is to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. The Christian rejoicing in this blessing of a thankful heart will have his eyes fixed on the right person. Remember Max Lucado describing the people in Tuckered Town? Their eyes are down, not up. And when our eyes are down and we're living under the circumstances, things look pretty bleak. But when we get our eyes fixed above the clouds 
and we realize that even though it looks gray and drab on earth, the sun is still shining, and the Son of God is still reigning, even when it doesn't appear to that way, then we can be thankful. We can be thankful regardless of our circumstances. A thankful spirit is a mark of Christian maturity. It means we're growing up in Christ. We're becoming more like him. When a believer is abounding in thanksgiving, he's really making progress. So as Christians, we need to be grounded in the gospel, growing in grace and gushing in gratitude. Now, in reviewing this program of progress, you see how growing Christians can easily defeat the enemy and not be led astray. If his spiritual roots are deep in Christ, he's not going to want to move to another soil. If Christ is his sure foundation, he has new, no need to move on to something else. If he's studying and growing in the word, he will not be easily enticed by false doctrine. And if his heart is overflowing with thanksgiving, he won't even consider turning away from the fullness he has in Christ. A grounded, growing, grateful believer will not be led astray. So stick with the program. Be grounded in the gospel. Remember, you came to Christ by faith. Continue to live by faith. Grow in grace. Add to your knowledge through the scriptures and then put it into practice. Exercise that faith. And then always be gushing with gratitude. Every day should be thanksgiving to the Christian. People should know of us to be grateful people. And there's something winsome about that. There's something very magnetic about a person who is grateful and appreciative for what they have, even if they don't have much. That's the kind of people we're called to be. And that's the kind of people that, number one, going to enjoy life. You know, I'm talking about the abundant life. That's it. But we're also going to be bringing others to Christ because they're going to see something in us that they want. And that's what Christ has called us to be. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you not only want to rescue us from an eternity in hell, but you want us to begin abundant life here on earth. And you've given us a program for that progress. I pray that we might grow in our faith whether we've known you for five years or 50 years, that we would never stop growing, we would never stop progressing, and that we would always be grateful. We do thank you for this church body that we can be a part of. We thank you for your love for us, your grace and your mercy to us. May we be grounded, growing, and grateful children. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.